there we go. Um, so this is going to be uh, more like a podcast rather than a lecture. And we're going to talk about some scripture um, as we go through it, particularly Psalm 65. And you should have, if you've gotten to the, uh, the Eventbrite page, there's a download of Ellen's own translation of that. And that will be relevant uh, a little bit later on. So, uh, so that's the plan. Um, Ellen and I will chat for a little bit. And then towards the end, we'll solicit questions um, through the chat. And we can have some good interaction on this. But um, in normal times, I would invite you to join me in offering some thunderous applause. But we'll just assume that's happening telepathically right now from all of you. So Ellen, uh, welcome to the conference. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's um, it's great to see you, Justin, in your new location and to see some of you in your several places on two continents. Um, so, Ellen, um, you are obviously an accomplished scholar um, and church person, but uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be interested in eco or environmental issues in particular and how that interfaces with your interest in scripture. Um, how did you how did you sort of decide to make this an aspect of your ministry? Um, it, I would say there are two roots to this. One is that I'm a Californian. Um, and so I grew up outside uh, a lot. Um, I grew up in an, on an island in the San Francisco Bay, not Alcatraz. Um, but um, so I grew up in a very fragile and very beautiful environment. And as I say, I was outside in it mo very much of the time. Um, and, um, and as a biblical scholar, and even long before I thought that I ever imagined I would be a biblical scholar, the other landscape I have come to know best is Israel. Um, and I studied there when I was 18. I um, studied in Jerusalem. And so from a young age, I was aware of two very beautiful, very fragile landscapes. And both of them have changed hugely in my own lifetime. Uh, so when I was uh, going back about 30 years, I was about 40, and I had um, made a visit to California to an area that I had not been to, the wine country, a little north of where I grew up, an area that I hadn't seen since my childhood, the, a particular part of it, um, I went with a friend. And um, I was shocked at how much it had changed at that time, maybe in the, you know, 30 years since I remembered it from my childhood. Um, it's an area that's now largely on fire. Um, and um, it, but even then, before we imagined the kinds of disasters that would be happening now in that region, it was evident to me that the treatment of that land did not have a millennia long trajectory. Um, and as a biblical scholar, I tend to think in millennia. Um, and so as I thought back over the four millennia that I am aware of in the Levant, Western Asia, uh, Israel, Palestine, and neighboring places. When I thought back over the four millennia that I know something about what's happened there, I thought neither in Western Asia nor in North America do we have four more millennia ahead of us on this trajectory. So, it was, it was sort of a wake up call. And I was at that point, um, deep enough into my teaching to know some of the things that were important to me and early enough in my teaching 
to have a lot of the years ahead of me. Um, and I decided that the most significant thing I could do is focus a fair amount of my attention on what I called at that time a biblical ecology, um, a biblical theology of land. I, these are not terms that were used much at that time, so I was kind of grappling to name something that had not been part of my own education. Um, and so I started just teaching a seminar uh, to kind of find out what was there. And within a few years, I realized that the center of gravity for these issues in the Bible has to do with agriculture, soil, care of land. Um, and I, I really didn't know enough in, about what was going on in this country to realize how central agriculture is, not just in my country, but in other countries as well, including Western Europe. Um, I didn't realize how much agriculture is at the center of the ecological crisis. So it's, it's been a sort of growing awareness for me, but um, sadly, um, confirming that original impression that I had, that if we didn't change the trajectory, mm. we didn't have millennia ahead of us. Mm. Um, that's really helpful. So the, the, the Bible then, as something that you see as thematically um, organized around the idea of land and agriculture is, is some, some exposing something that we've forgotten, yet is still the case in our world now, you think? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. The Bible, I mean, I mentioned a few minutes ago that I had grown up mostly outside. Um, mm. Well, Israelites, ancient Israelites lived outside. Um, mm. And as Wendell Berry says, the Bible is an outdoor book. Mm. Um, the land of Israel, it was not a land of large cities, unlike the, you know, the great empires, especially in Mesopotamia. Um, Israel was a land of small farmers. Um, virtually everyone, I'm sure 99% of the population involved directly in food production. Um, even those who lived in the cities, they, if you've read the book of Ruth, people are going outside the wall of the city to farm their fields. And so it was in Jerusalem and, and other um, cities and towns in Israel. Um, and, and so it's an interesting thing. There's no biblical Hebrew word for what we call nature um, because there was no concept of nature as being, it was just the world. <laughs> um, there was no concept of nature as being separate from human beings and our sphere. Um, and the biblical writers refer to people as they refer to um, what we call nature, it's all called Ma'ase Yadeh Elohim, the, the work of God's hands. And so our notion of environment or nature as something that doesn't include us is a fundamentally non-biblical way to think. Wow. So, um, there's something there about our relationship to God as, as our creator that establishes that. That's, what, what is it that sort of binds us all together, you know, not as human beings and nature, but as the work of God's hands? Well, uh, the biblical term for what binds us together, the most common one is covenant. Right. Um, and and blessing, you know, maybe those would be two concepts to think about, blessing and covenant. And if you think about 
the first chapter of the Bible, God blesses the um, creatures of sea and sky on the fifth day of creation. Be fruitful and multiply, God says. Um, exactly the same um, that words that God uses to human beings, be fruitful and multiply and fill the mm. uh, territory. Uh, that's the fifth day before humans have even been created. And then humans are created on the sixth day, also blessed. Um, but surely the blessing of humans on the sixth day is meant to further the blessing of the fifth day, not to annul it. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and then um, in the second chapter of of Genesis, humans are created. Um, the Hebrew words are Adam, human being, from Adama, fertile soil. The pun in, actually works in English. Humans, mm -hmm. humans are created from humus. Um, and so they are kin to soil. And then God makes a covenant with all flesh in Genesis 9 that includes non-human creatures um, and so it goes on and God speaks in Leviticus um, about a covenant with um, God says I will remember my covenant this chapter 24 25 of Leviticus I will remember my covenant with with Jacob, I will remember my covenant. With Isaac, I will remember my covenant. With Abraham and the land, I will remember. Mm -hmm. And so covenant itself is bound up with God's attention to the land itself. I would take it from that, that the land is at the very least a basis for covenant, but quite likely the land is a covenant partner with oh, God and Israel. I could go on, but yeah, that's yeah. enough to start. Um, before we get into the psalm itself, um, I wonder what you might say to someone who says, okay, yes, the, the, the land is central to the Old Testament. That's because it was an agrarian society. Um, we no longer live in an agrarian society. Um, how much should we be looking at the Bible as the lens through which we understand the world when we live in a fundamentally different context? I mean, had the, the context for the Bible been in an industrial center, would we be saying cities are the center of reality? So what, what is it about um, an agrarian view that is more than just incidental to the context of the Bible, but is really important? I think that the Bible could not have been written as it was written, would not have been written as it is written in, um, if you want to call it, an ancient industrialized society. Yeah. Um, that in itself, you might regard as providential. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, the Bible is seeing something that, um, that was true then and is true now. And that is that the health of humans and human communities is inseparable from the health of land and what you might call land communities, including water, air, micro, microbial communities. Um, all of those things have not become um, passe antiquated uh, despite the fact that we live in a highly urbanized environment um, so i think the i think we need to learn to read the bible not nostalgically we're not going to go back to villages of 50 to 100 people uh, in most cases um, but to learn it with a, to read it with a kind of 
spiritual alertness. Um, and it has been striking to me now through, now through 30 years of teaching the Bible in communities with groups of people who know much, much more about the realities of farming uh, and land care than I do. Um, so I bring what I know to those conversations, um, which is basically the text, and say, how does this sound to you? And mm -hmm. over and over again, it has been confirmed to me in cities and in rural settings, in academic settings and on farms, that as Wes Jackson, the founder of the Land Institute in Kansas, um, in this country said, the Bible always gets it right about land. Sort of basic perceptions uh, of how we live wisely with the land on which our life depends, that, as he sees it, the Bible gets it right. Wow, that's amazing. Um, well, um, we have uh, a few questions generated. I think I'm gonna ask one of them actually to you because I think okay. it's on the nose. So um, Mark asks, uh, to what extent is the entire Old Testament one big comparison and critique of different agroeconomic systems? So Egyptian versus Babylonian versus Syrian, Israel, Judea, Judea, pastoral nomadic. Is there an implicit critique in there itself what already? An what an interesting question. Um, I would say that... Um, I've never, th I've never thought of the Bible exactly in those terms. Um, I don't think there's any question that the Bible is aware of um, different ways of relating to the land um, mm -hmm. and um, is both critical and self-critical. Um, the tension and is, is, acknowledging tensions. So um, the story of Cain and Abel in the fourth chapter of Genesis, that's, that is a story that has multiple layers in it, as does virtually every text in the Bible has multiple layers. So I don't want to reduce it to um, a sociological critique, but there is no question that in my mind, that one of the layers in the Cain and Abel story is the tension between nomadism and settled agriculture, um, which was an abiding tension um, in Western Asia, the Levant, um, even into my lifetime. I mean, I think I have lived through the, maybe the final closure, who knows, uh, but the closure of nomadic roots by settled agriculture, nomadic roots that had existed time out of mind. Uh, but that was already um, a tension between settled farmers and nomads, a tension and a complementarity that existed in every village and probably every extended family. Um, you had both people out um, taking the flocks for their seasonal migration and you had people staying at home tending the field. Um, the, I would read as being fundamental to um, the story of, um, it, of Israel leaving Egypt, fleeing Egypt and um, crossing the Red Sea, what's the first thing that they do on the other side of the Red Sea? The first thing they do is figure out how they're going to eat. Now, they don't figure out how they're gonna eat. God tells them how they're gonna eat. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, 
and what they and they have trouble learning a different way of eating a way of eating in which everyone has enough an economy of sufficiency because they were accustomed to a different economy food economy in Egypt which was controlled not by God but by Pharaoh um, who was the titular owner of all of the land in Egypt so I mean those are just two examples that yes um, and one could multiply examples they are aware of other modes of controlling the food supply, including within the land of Israel with the kings controlling the food supply. Um, I think the prophetic movement in Israel um, rises in the face of the conversion of agriculture from uh, subsistence-based, small farming, regionally-based, to centralization of agriculture by the kings of Israel and Judah. Mm. So yes, Mark, I think that is one facet running through the whole Bible, um, including the New Testament. And we'll talk about that later. This, this is so fascinating, Ellen, um, to just, I don't to imagine that context that's just ever present in the Bible that we just don't see yeah. in our industrialized urban setting, that this would have been the majority of their daily lives. Um, getting lots of great questions in the chat, which I'll return to in a bit because I want to make sure that the Bible gets a, a hearing as well a little bit here, even more than we have. So um, you've chosen to talk about, well, a couple of texts, Psalm 65 and then John chapter 6, but mostly Psalm 65 for now, um, as a way of helping to reframe our imagination of the world. So why... So the Psalms, um, I mean, many of us pray the Psalms on a daily basis, if we're good Anglicans, especially. Um, many of us pray the Psalms. And, um, uh, but how, uh, how does Psalms function in sort of reprogramming ourselves to get in the spirit of this biblical perspective that you've been speaking of? One of the great things about the Psalms is, and I, you need to know, I'm very partial to the Psalms. Um, yeah. And right now I'm translating them. So I'm fairly obsessed with them. But um, one of the great things about the Psalms is that one, when you're reading a Psalm, in most cases, you are reading a, a complete piece. You know, much of the time when we're reading it, we're hearing in church a, a passage of scripture, we're hearing a bit of you know, something much larger. But a Psalm is a complete piece. Um, it's a poem. It is, and like other modes of great poetry, it's a reframing of the world, um, or an, suddenly a close look at a piece of the world um, from a perspective we don't usually view it, or we look right mm -hmm. past it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one reason I'm partial to the Psalms. Um, and one other I'll mention is that um, on the whole, this is the poetry of ordinary people. If, if the Psalms were, I don't want to say written, composed, because they're in the first instance oral literature, if they were composed probably by guilds of professional singers, for the most part. Nonetheless, they were in the mouths of ordinary people, um, just as they are today, um, bringing, and very many of the Psalms speak in the first person. Um, mm -hmm. And so we are, when we're praying the Psalms, we're bringing our experience, our feelings, our aspirations, our fears before God. Um, other parts of the Bible, you're hearing God speak, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or you're hearing a story, but the Psalms really put us front and center. In, mm -hmm. Ultimately, God is front and center, but we're mm -hmm. right there interacting with God, and I think that's powerful. Brilliant. Um, okay, so you've chosen Psalm 65, and you've translated it for us. Um, right. So what's, what's wrong with the, uh, the regular old 
an RSV or whatever our preference is. Why, why did you feel the need to retranslate this? Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm a scholar and my, my project right now is to translate yeah, yeah. the songs. <laughs> but the reason why, even if that isn't what I was doing with my life right now, um, even if that were not the case, I still would have had to translate this particular psalm for you because almost all published translations, including, um, God forgive me, the Book of Common Prayer, um, in its various translations, um, in its various versions, um, and uh, mistranslates the first line. And so, and I think they do it simply because it doesn't make sense to people. So the first line of the psalm is speaking to God, to you, silence is praise. To you, silence is praise, O God in Zion, and to you, vows are, are paid. Almost every published translation is going to have something like, um, to you, silence is fitting, um, silence is pleasing. I know where they get that, but it actually involves amending the text in order to come up with that English translation, uh, because the Hebrew is really pretty straight forward. Silence is praise. The problem is that's not how we normally live and think. And so it involves a conversion of our imagination to see how silence could be praise for God. And, and I think the Psalm expects us to be puzzled by that. Yes. Um, and that's, you might say, the guiding question for this Psalm. Yeah. How is it that silence could be praised. Yeah. Uh, such an evocative um, translation. Um, uh, I wonder if uh, if you could read this for us and then kind of just walk us through the text. Sure. Um, for the lead musician, a psalm. For David, a song. To you, silence is praise, O God in Zion, and to you, vows are paid. O oh, you who hear prayer, before you all flesh comes. Reports of wrongdoing overwhelm me. Our transgressions, it is you who atone for them. Uh, the next word is one I'm debating. Um, happy the one, but today's translation is it is well with the one you choose and allow to come near who dwells in your courts. May we be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. With awesome works in righteousness, you respond to us, O God of our salvation. Confidence of all the ends of the earth and the far reaches of the sea. He sets firm mountains in his strength. He is girded with might. He stills the roar of the seas, the roar of their waves and the din of nations. Those dwelling at earth's ends feel reverent fear at your signs. The horizons of morning and evening, you make ring with joy. You visit the earth and water it, abundantly you enrich it. God's stream full of water. You set their grain just so you set it, drenching its furrows, settling its hillocks. You soften it with showers, its growth you bless. You crown the year with your goodness and your wagon tracks drip richness. Wilderness pastures are dripping. The hills put on a belt of joy. Meadows are clothed with the flocks and valleys are cloaked in grain. They shout out, they even sing. Thank you. 
Um, what a great, I mean, I love that. Um, the wagon tracks, tracks dripping with redness, which is a brilliant, brilliant image. It's, um, it, yeah, it's a wonderful, this is the only Psalm in, it's the only text in the Bible that gives us an extended picture of God as a peasant farmer. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so yeah, t talk us through this because there's, there's, it seems, I mean, looking at the Psalm again, after what you've, you've been saying earlier, I mean, it seems like everything is in this Psalm. There's temple, there's covenant, there's people, there's repentance, yeah. there's restoration, there's land, there's everything. So what, what is, uh, what, what is this Psalm all about? What's the progression of thought here? Okay, well, I'll point out a few things and then you can ask me things that I may have missed. Um, I, this Psalm, I think, is, um, it's showing us an economy of abundance. And remember, the economy of, you know, when we, speak of economics, we're talking about money. Um, but in the Bible, if you use that word um, with reference to the Bible, you're talking about land um, and food production. And so this is an economy of, I'm torn between the word abundance and sufficiency. And I think that there's, there's an important interplay between those two, and maybe that's something we can talk about. So um, just to point out a few things here. Um, in verse three, O oh, you who hear prayer, by the way, that's the only time in the Bible that God is addressed that way. All of the Psalms assume that God hears prayer, but this is the only one that actually calls God the one who hears prayer before you all flesh comes so again not just humans but all of the um breathing creatures god created um and then th this is to me quite striking the first thing that comes out of the silence that the psalmist declares at the beginning the first thing that comes out of that silence is a sense of being overwhelmed by sin. Reports of wrongdoing overwhelm me, our transgressions. It is you, God, who atone for them. Um, which is to say we're in deeper than we can get out on our own. Mm. Um, and all flesh comes before God but not all flesh is in a state of sin. Um, as the Bible understands it, um, wrongdoing, transgressions, those are distinctly human activities. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have that confession of sin and then kind of change of frame. Um, we're in the temple. Um, it is well with the one you choose and allow to come near who dwells in your courts. May we be satisfied with the goodness of your house. This is actually the essence of the prayer that we're presenting before God. May we be satisfied. Um, it seems to me that's in a sense the crux of the whole matter. Um, mm -hmm. And I can't think of a prayer that has, should have more resonance in our culture than the prayer that we might experience satisfaction with what God, with the goodness that God pours out. Um, mm -hmm. And that we sense in the intimate presence of God, which is what the temple represents. Um, because we, the crisis in which we are deeply immersed is a crisis that stems from consumption, from the inability to be satisfied with mm. enough. That, that's helpful. And so we had a question in the chat about when you were speaking of abundance, 
um, how do we avoid that translating into greed? Right. You know, if there's just um, so much stuff, how do we avoid hoarding it and, and all of that? How do we ensure equity I, for I would say reread Exodus 16, reread the manna story. Mm. Um, and um, there are two rules. Um, you, uh, you know, you collect only enough for your household um, and you don't try to keep it over and you don't collect on Sabbath. Those are the only two rules. Um, mm. And so um, the first is against hoarding. It's against greed. Um, it's against more than you need. And the second, don't collect on Sabbath, is against becoming addicted to your own activity and stepping back um, and understanding that always, everywhere, sufficiency um, comes from God. Hmm. That's what said. That's what Sabbath is about. It's about stepping back, not don't just do something, stand there uh, in the yes. presence of God. Yes. So, um, so what? Uh, that's helpful. I know we're going to get to this. We get to John too um, in a okay. moment. Okay. We'll carry on with that. But um, what? What's the relationship here between? Um, the uh, God's care of the earth and also these sort of temple images. The temple yeah. is the place, the temple um, is the place where all Israelites are commanded to go to the temple in Jerusalem uh, for three occasions each year, probably people went one of those times if they were so fortunate. But the temple is the place uh, where we experience life as it is meant to be. Uh, the temple is Eden replanted ideologically in the Bible. Um, and it's the garden of God. And so we, it's the pilgrimage to the temple is the return from exile, the original exile from Eden. Um, and the temple is also understood as the place in which creation, and this is true to this day, in certainly in Jewish and Muslim um, uh, religious thought, the temp Jerusalem is the place where creation begins, and it is the place where new creation, where resurrection will also begin. Uh, and certainly that's true in the New Testament. And so not surprisingly, what the psalmist offers us is a picture of God as creator. This is the perception that mm -hmm. comes to the psalmist in the temple, seeing God creating at the macro level. He sets firm mountains in his strength stills the roar of the sea and so on, verse, this is verse seven. And then that same word is echoed in verse 10. You visit the earth and water it, you enrich it, God's stream full of water. Remember that um, Israel is not, Israel is not Britain. Um, it's not, um, nor is it Toronto or North Carolina. It, Israel is a semi-arid landscape. Oh, have you heard Jerusalem by William Blake? Because, you know, maybe it is, but uh, never mind. Jerusalem is, is at the very edge of the Judean desert. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, four years out of 10, and this was before climate change, were drought years. Um, and so uh, there's this vision of God watering the earth. And then that same word that we saw with God setting the mountains Firm, God sets the grain in the seed heads. So God works at the macro level and the micro mm -hmm. level of creation. And what that says, I told you it, the hearers, readers, singers of this psalm in antiquity 
are virtually themselves, every one of them, farmers. And so what they hear is that God's work is like our work. And in our work, we are fulfilling God's intention in creation. We are doing imitatio dei, mm -hmm. imitation of God's work by setting, doing our work to water those furrows, settling the hillocks. Uh, so God's work of setting the grain and the seed heads can be done. And then just to answer, so we can move on, just to answer your question about um, silence. Yeah. If we can be silent and enter into this vision of the world and see how we have messed it up um, and God is seeking to restore it, then we can also be attuned to the praise of the creatures, meadows um, uh, and valleys are shouting out, they even sing and those are words of praise for the psalmist that's um that's great that move from silence to shouting um it's really fascinating um these are the uh, i want to get to john and then the questions but i wonder i mean one of the themes that i've been picking up on in the conference so far is this disconnect between activists who care about the environment and want to do things and spiritualists kind of uh, prioritize church and the spiritual aspects of life and the sort of uh, how they never come together, right? For some, environmentalism is a distraction from the gospel. And for others, the gospel is a distraction from environmentalism. And I think a, a big motivation for this conference is how do we reconceive of the whole thing so these aren't viewed as antagonistic to one another, at least in a competitive relationship. And this psalm, in sort of viewing the temple as the earth. I wonder if that has a potential to sort of help us reconceptualize what church even is. If, if we well, are I constantly think... living in the temple and there's no escape, right? From either side of that dichotomy. I think that's a fruitful idea. Um, and one might also extend that to the notion of, of bodies as mm. the temple of God. Mm. Um, so observing the integrity of all of those, I would say, certainly I'm familiar with what you just said about environmentalism often being seen as antithetical to um, spirituality, theology, the church's faith, whatever. I, I would say that maybe one rather simple way um, of beginning to reconceive that would be to reconsider how useful is the phrase environmentalism. Yeah. Uh, and as I said yeah. a little while ago, the concept of environment is not a biblical concept. Yeah. Um, and even and so what if you think of all of it as the work of God's hands? Um, and then try to think of something that's not the work of God's hands. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. So. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, okay, so you want to uh, finish us off here with John chapter six as uh, another way of um, looking at this. Um, you've asked me to read this. This is John chapter yeah. six. And I'll just say as preface that yeah, sure. I think I'll, that I think John chapter six is useful to us because it is another account of um, an economy of abundance, sufficiency uh, in a world of scarcity. And mm. important to remember that the biblical world was a hungry world. Um, and so it's not, there's something so basic about the stories of the feeding of the crowds that this is the only pericope that occurs in every single gospel. Mm -hmm. Jesus feeds. Um, so that I thought would be useful for us. To right. Well, I'll read it. And then if you just walk us through it, 
and then sure. we'll get to some questions sure. from uh, from the crowd. So this is John chapter six, verses one through fifteen. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just highlight a few things here. Um, first, first of all, and this is something I only saw about a month ago for the first time, after G the first line, um, after Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. Um, now, it, it isn't necessary for anyone um, in this region to have the Sea of Galilee identified for them. It's not a geographical necessity to have the Sea of Galilee identified as the Sea of Tiberias. Everybody knows where Galilee is. Um, but by calling it the Sea of Tiberias, this is a reminder that Tiberius Caesar controls this region. It's a reminder of who controls the food economy um, and life all together in um, Judea, the Roman province, uh, where um, if you are a farmer or a fisher, um, your life is largely controlled by the licensing, the marketing, the distribution um, of um, that Tiberius Caesar um, yeah. controls. So it's just a reminder of a setting, um, the way these people are living. And they are, we know already, the large crowd gathers because of what Jesus is doing for the sick. These people are sick and they're hungry. Uh, and they're probably sick because they're hungry. Um, uh, undernutrition is a um, serious issue in the biblical world, as I've said. So I'm just going to fast forward then um, to so we have the background here, um, where are we going to get enough food for them to eat? Um, six months wages wouldn't buy enough uh, for each of them to get even a little. This is, Philip is thinking in terms of an economy of scarcity, not enough to go around, very familiar to our way of thinking economically. Um, and, um, then we hear that there's a boy who has five barley loaves. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. And two fish. Um, and Jesus says, make the people sit down. There's a great deal of grass in that place. So Jesus makes them sit 
down in a grassy place. Um, and as we know, they will have plenty to eat in that grassy place. Does this remind you of anything? Well, it does remind me of something because I read your notes, but tell us. <laughs> it, reminds me, it reminds me of Psalm 23. Exactly. There it is. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. So, um, uh, bin ot deshe ja vitseni, but in um, uh, in a grassy place he makes me lie down. Adonai roi, the Lord is my shep shepherd. Lo echsar, I shall lack for nothing. Okay, and what we're going to see then is the people lacking for nothing. So. Um, um, Jesus took the loaves when given thanks, he distributed them and they were seated, those who were seated, so all the fish as much as they wanted, lo echsar, I lack for nothing. When they were satisfied, again, in case you missed it, they lack for nothing. He don't, told the disciples, gather up the fragments. The English translation has left over but the Greek says, gather up the broken pieces that are overflowing. We think of leftovers as kind of, you know, second best. Um, but gather up the pieces that are overflowing. There's an, this is the abundance that comes from God. Um, so nothing may be wasted. Um, so nothing may be lost. The principle here is the same principle that we were just talking about in the manna economy. If you don't waste, there is enough and more than enough. Um, and here I want to just hearken back to those barley loaves because we're told twice that these are loaves of barley. You know, why not just bread? Um, Two reasons, I think. Uh, one, barley is the grain of the poor. Um, wheat is the grain of the well-to-do in the biblical world. Um, but barley you can grow in poor land that won't keep, um, that won't grow wheat. So barley is the, the common um, grain. Um, also, I think there are echoes here of Ruth, the story of Ruth, yeah. mother of the Messiah, great grandmother of David. Um, and so Jesus's ancestor. Um, but Ruth is a poor woman who becomes an agent of survival and thriving in Bethlehem in the time of the barley harvest. Uh, so I think that that's, in John's gospel, there are probably no details that are idle. He's always mm -hmm. wanting us to remember, uh, you know, the, remember the backstory to this. Uh, and then I'll uh, just read the last couple of verses again. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Uh, the prophet who has come into the world, this is an echo of Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, when Moses says, God will send a prophet like me. Um, and Jesus looks an awful lot like Moses uh, at the beginning here um, when he sits down to um, uh, teach his disciples. Um, and um, he's giving, sorry, um, I, he went up on the mountain, I'm at verse three, and sat down there with his disciples. Uh, he went up on the mountain, this is another holy mountain, like Moses, mm -hmm. um, and he's going, and he goes there with his disciples, he's going to give them a teaching. This is another Torah from Sinai, teaching from Sinai teaching from the mountain. Um, and so Jesus 
is the prophet, the teacher like Moses, but the people don't want a prophet. They want a king. Uh, Jesus realized they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. Uh, and so he withdrew to the mountain by himself. They want a power broker. They want their own Caesar, so to speak, um, to face off against Tiberius Caesar. And that's, that's not what Jesus is about. Oh, and, um, this is amazing. I wish I could read the Bible and see all these things the way that you see them uh, and have all the background of the agri agricultural context. This is um, amazing. Um, there's that book, um, Seeing the Bible Through Middle Eastern Eyes. I want like seeing the Bible through Ellen Davis's eyes to be written one day. Um, so um, to, to bring us to a conclusion, well, I'll save this question for the end. Let's get to some audience questions and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you a chance to do a little manifestoing um, towards the end. So we've got a bunch of questions here. Um, so uh, right. here's a question from Regina Ebner, who says, if you could choose one key scripture that pointed the way to how we should live now, I assume vis-a-vis -vis the current ecological crises, what would it be and why? Okay, I've, I think I've just, I have just lost the picture of you. Oh, have you? I can get back. I clicked something. Oh, you don't need to see me. Okay, I'm back. Okay. Yep. Okay. It's just disorienting <clears throat> not to. If I could pick um, one scripture that speaks about how we should live and why. Uh, about the ecological crisis, yeah. I, I can't um, because <laughs> I thought when I first started working in this area, I mm. thought um, that I needed to pick the right text. And then I realized that almost every text in the Bible is talking about the things that we're talking about. It's talking about, um, for the reasons that I that I've told you, it's um, uh, it's the Bible is dealing with the ordinary stuff of existence as people mm. in the ancient world saw it. Mm. And so I have found uh, in my teaching, it's I could open the Bible almost at random and talk about this stuff. So I've you know we've walked through two two texts. We could have walked through a thousand others um, and found things that we need to hear. Mm. Um, I've, I'll just comment that I just finished teaching a class um, in the spring that I'd never taught before. I taught it with my colleague, Professor Jerusha Neal, as a professor of homiletics preaching. And we taught a class on preaching biblical preaching in view of climate change. And our, in the course of the 13, 14 weeks of the semester, we went selectively, of course, from Genesis through, through Revelation. Because what we wanted the students to get is that you can land just about any place and deal with issues uh, that relate to, um, that illumine our relation to the work of God's hands, the created order. Um, and then the students in their own preaching picked dozens of other texts. And I was astonished at the texts that they picked and mm. how they heard those in ways I'd never heard them. Um, so why why don't we see it um i mean i'm reminded yeah go on because it's not i mean the answer for me as a scholar is it's not how i was taught to read the bible um mm. and i thought when i started doing this and especially when i started publishing it i actually thought i would be laughed out of the scholarly guild um and uh, but in fact people have um on the whole been persuaded because it works 
Um, and I would say that for my students, um, and maybe many people listening, um, we don't see it because it's not how it's preached. It's not how it's taught in church because like me, those people, that's not how they studied. Um, and so, um, but there is a change happening. It's not just me, it's um, lots of people now are beginning to read from this perspective and it's sort of filtering through the system. So um, if, if the Lord tarries, um, then in another generation, I think people will read quite differently. And we need to be part of that. Um, well, that's a good um, transition to another question. Um, if the Lord tarries, um, if, if the Lord does tarry, what is our hope for deliverance? given all the existential threat that we're facing from the climate crisis? Is there a way for Christians to, yeah. to be comforted in some way or for the world to be comforted in some way despite all of this? Um, I, well, first of all, our, as all of the Psalms are turning us to and John, our hope is in God. You know, we are, um, we are in, we are in trouble deeper than we can get out of on our own. Um, and, but I will say, and this is my own local answer, but I think the right answer to this question, what is our hope, is um, millions upon billions of local answers from um, every person of faith. I find hope in my students um, and their determination and their determination to be agents of hope in their communities. And again, uh, most of them enter my classroom not familiar with these issues, not only vaguely aware of their own responsibility and complicity in the depth of the problem, mm -hmm. um, but um, they, in most cases, um, they are open to sort of making the move that the psalmist makes of claiming that complicity um, and uh, and looking to God and seeking seeking support in change. Surely, there are the encouraging technological developments, encouraging changes in um, in agriculture and new possibilities, um, even as the big. Um, multinational industrial engine continues to pump and to destroy, but there are millions of alternatives emerging in different places. And um, the hope rests in getting on board with those, finding out what's happening in your community. There are things happening in your community. I say that as an article of faith, um, <laughs> but... Mm -hmm but I haven't encountered any community in which there isn't something happening, even if the first step often is lament mm. to realize there's something profoundly wrong. Um, and often you have to, as the psalmist do, often you have to begin with lament before you can begin to see grounds for realistic hope. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, got a question from Joe Howard on um, other than human creation and whether we ought to um, regard other than human or non-human creation as subjects. Um, should we adjust our language of using the land or using animals even, I suppose? Um, to get rid of this utilitarian attitude? How do we view non-human creation? I'm afraid you're 
voice is becoming um, oh, sorry. I, was, I think I think I was gesticulating over my microphone. Sorry about that. Okay, can we, um, can we try yeah. that again? So, and so maybe you can change. Where is this? That this so, is. Uh, oh, it's been direct message. Can me. you point it in the chat? Oh, okay. That's, okay. It, for us, it would have been fourteen eighteen. What is the shape of your hope for deliverance? Is this the one? No, this is, so, so it says, hi, Ellen, to what extent is it important to afford other than human creation subjectivity? Do we need to adjust our language of using the land to reflect the less utilitarian attitude? That's an interesting question. And I would say that, um, I don't actually think there's anything wrong with the notion of using the land. Here, I would appeal to Wendell Berry's distinction between um, Wendell Berry's notion of kindly use. Um, and certainly, I think that that would accord with the way the Bible thinks about humans interacting with land. Um, and we need the land, um, and but um, we need to use it as the gift and the trust that it is. The Bible, um, the biblical writers understand land as a multi generational trust, it's not something that anyone, uh, well the owner of the land, um, this is Leviticus, is is God. Mm. Um, and we are, it is entrusted to us for the purpose of kindly use, to use Wendell's phrase. Um, and well, maybe that's, maybe that's enough. Um, what about, what about animals? Um, how are we supposed to view Ah, okay, okay. Um, the um, from a, I, I'm going to stay pretty much with a biblical perspective here. <laughs> okay. um, and from a biblical perspective, vegetarianism is it's not. It's not a value, particularly. Um, and but on the other hand, Israelites eat ate meat rarely. Um, and so it was regarded as a it was a feast. It was a special occasion. It was it was regarded as an indication of blessing when you could eat meat. But again, that was um, that was for almost all people. That was rare, and if you um, probably the place we hear about the most um, meat eating in the Bible is Solomon's table, and as you know, Solomon is um, is a very mixed figure in the Bible, and one of the things Solomon stands for is royal ex exploitation of the people of the land who are the ones who are providing all of those Robux for mm -hmm. Solomon's table. Um, and in our own time, um, certainly the, you know, the Bible expects that people are going to be slaughtering animals, um, but doing it in a way that respects um, respects life as a gift from God. Um, and this is why both Jews and Muslims um, don't consume blood. Mm. Um, and this and this is actually an area in which I think Christians are lagging behind um, some of our um, brothers and sisters in other faiths uh, in, in thinking about, um, I mean, for most people, for Israelites, our 
butcher shops, our meat counters on the whole would be seen as an abomination. Wow. Certainly industrialized yeah. uh, meat production yeah. uh, is an abomination. I'll just point out one other thing. And again, I'm thinking of the Psalm, Psalm 36, striking line, human and animal you save, O oh God. Um, I dare say not many of us are familiar with that line, human and animal you save, O oh God, because we tend to think of salvation as something that is exclusively for human beings. Uh, that's not a very biblical way of thinking about that. Um, we're, we're rounding the end here. We've got lots of good questions in the chat um, uh, that we unfortunately don't have time to get um, through. But I did want to ask you, just as a closing comment, the, the title of the conference is Sustaining Church. And we're trying to reimagine what church might look like in light of this worldview that you've been describing, this biblical worldview, and particularly in light of the climate crisis. So if you could dream, right, what churches ought to look like in light of these two factors? What, what does like a local church look like that takes all these things to heart that you've been speaking of? Um, again, I think that it would look different in different places. Um, but I would say that my hope for the church would be that it could embrace that prayer from Psalm 65. May we be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. Um, so that we could begin to conceive church as a place of genuine satisfaction. Um, and the church, that the, the the Torah, the instruction that the church would be involved in would be um, helping its members learn to live in, in an economy of sufficiency for mm -hmm. everyone. Uh, and for many of us, I notice that one of our members um, has just left to go to Compline at the convent. Uh, so perhaps not for Emma, but for many of us, um, living into profound satisfaction would involve a conver conversion of our desire mm -hmm. and a freedom from fear, from the fear of scarcity that is almost unimaginable to many of us because we have so deeply internalized the principles of an economy of scarcity and waste rather than the kind of sufficiency um, and trust in God that leads to God's definition of abundance, which precludes waste. That's amazing. Thank you so much, um, Ellen, for this and for all of this. Um, uh, if any of you guys have been piqued uh, in your interest of what Ellen's saying, I do really encourage you to go check out her book, Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture, uh, 2009, um, where she sort of puts all this on display in, in much greater detail. So do go check that out. But um, Ellen, thank you so much for this thank you. session, for talking pleasure. us through this. Okay. Um, we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Um, Bye. Here's, and we're back here tomorrow at some time that I can't remember because of time zone differences, but check out your conference schedule and we have more sessions uh, forthcoming. So good night, everyone, and thanks for being here. Thank you.